Before I read this passage, I just want you to get this uh, title, that is, when you truly understand the gospel, and then to make the sense of this statement, we have to go back to a verse in the Bible that we call the shortest verse in the Bible. And uh, I, I am sure many of you are familiar with that. The shortest verse of the Bible said, Jesus cried. And the reason for him to cry was, he was coming to Bethany, where Lazarus was dead and buried for four days. And he explains to Martha and to Mary and to the rest of the disciples who he was, and they kept on explaining something else. They did not get what Jesus was trying to tell them. Martha could not understand what the Lord was trying to tell her. Mary could not, the Jews could not, the disciples could not. And therefore I think the reason Jesus cried was how come that you don't understand who you are talking to? How long will I explain to you who I am? Some people think that he cried because he was so close to Lazarus and he felt so sad. Of course, he was close and he must have felt sad, but he was going to raise him up anyway. There was no reason for him to pretend to, say, to be so sad and sorry and weep before the people and then go and raise him up. With all possibility in my mind, he was hurt by the lack of faith from his own disciples. The very closest person that he was hanging around did not believe what he was telling them. They could not understand who this Jesus is in reality. They say, yeah, he will rise up after he, you know, all these things. But Jesus said, no, I wanted you to say, Jesus, the son of the living God, you are God and you can raise this man from the dead now. They couldn't do those things. They could not understand. They could not believe and that hurt him and he cried. Here, when you understand the gospel, there are going to be some of the fundamental changes that will follow. If you understand the gospel, then that understanding is going to change you for the rest of your life. If not, it will also change you for something else. So, with that, let me read these few verses here in chapter 18 verse 9 onward until 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than other, the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This passage is in the context of Jesus' exhortation to pray continuously. Before then that, he gave a parable of how a widow constantly, constantly appealed to the judge and though this judge was unjust and ungodly, he said, I'm going to answer this lady and Jesus said God will also answer you if you keep praying if you pray and then to make this seeking after God to praying and to asking from God in a proper context he puts another parable and then he clarifies in which context or what kind of prayers will receive the answer from God. What kind of attitude behind the prayer? What is the motivation behind your prayer? Because the kind of prayer you pray will reflect the character you may have. 
So therefore, he is giving this parable in order to make sure that you truly understand what it is to pray to God and how your prayers will be either answered or not answered or you will be justified before God for what you are asking or you will be condemned for asking something that is not right. So to explain that, he gives these two individuals and uh, those of you who have been raised in Christian traditions, you know this by memory. But for us, it is a stark contrast. It's a divine contradiction he's putting here. There are two men. One is a Pharisee, one is a tax collector. This is a kind of an oxymoron that they they both would go to the temple. Pharisee would go to the temple. That is understandable because they were the standard bearer of morality, spirituality, and all the, the good in the society. They were the ones who embodied what it is to be a decent human being, a godly human being, or a righteous human being. But the tax collector was the embodiment of at that time of what it is to be an evil person. A person who is God forsaken, that's the word. A person who has nothing of a morality in him. No humanity, no decency, no honesty, no loyalty. All that this person has is self and driven by greed and self-interest. Because these tax collectors were feeding the Romans out of the backs of their own people. They were giving the money to the Romans so that the Romans would continue to oppress these Jews in the Palestinian territories. And therefore, they were known as the sinners or the embodiment of the example of sinners, wickedness. Not only towards God, but towards fellow human beings and toward the countrymen. They were the traitors. And in today's term, I know some of your countries are developed and they are very honest people. But in our country, in especially you come to any developing country, the border security and the custom officials are still not far from these tax collectors. They are some of the most corrupted officials in the nation. But uh, to put this tax collector in a better light would be, maybe you have heard the human trafficking or sexual exploitation of the children. They, they steal the children, kidnap the children and sell them for money. Maybe that would describe this man who is tax collector and both of them go to the temple and both of them pray to God and both of them receive answer now there is a good side of the Pharisee as well we think that Pharisee means it's all evil and bad no there are some good side in the Pharisee let us see, what are the good side of this Pharisee? He says, God, I am not like the other men. That means I am not like the heathens, those who don't worship you. I am not like those people who worship idols and who don't worship you. I worship you. I have come here to thank you. I have come here to acknowledge you in my life. I am not like other men and I am not like a robbers. I am not a thief. I don't steal from people. I, I don't covet my neighbor's uh, property or his or, uh, anything that he has. I am obeying the Ten Commandments. What this man is telling is that I am following the Ten Commandments. I obey the commandments of God. I do not violate the commandments of God. I do not go against the word of God. I keep those rules. For first, he said, I am not like other men. I worship you. That means first, second commandment he is keeping there. Even the Sabbath he is keeping very faithfully. Then he is telling, I am not a thief. I am not a robber. And he is telling, I follow even the fifth, sixth, seventh commandments very carefully. And I am not an evildoer. I am not an unjust man. I don't falsely testify against my neighbor. I don't go and kill or murder or destroy. I am a good man. I am not an evil person. Then he said, I am not an adulterer. I am faithful to my wife. I love my wife. I don't commit sexual immorality. I am a good person. And so much so, Lord, 
I am not even like this tax collector. I am not a traitor of his own people. I am not greedy. I am a righteous man. The good sign of the Pharisee is that he is following the commandments of God. And that is a good thing. Jesus clearly said, if your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You have no choice but to follow the word of God. And the Pharisee said, I do it. And the next thing he says is, I not only obey the commandments of God, I also fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I earn. I fast two times in one week and I am faithful in tithing, in giving. That means I practice my spirituality. I obey your word. I'm given to obedience. I follow your law and then I practice my spirituality. I think these two things are good. We all should aspire to do, don't we? We also desire to obey the word of God, or obey the commandments of God, and then practice our spirituality. Fasting, definitely, it is a good thing. When you fast, there is some mysterious element in it. And one of the reasons that we ought to fast, as I said in our retreat also, one of the reasons we must give a thought to fasting is that this is one of the biblical way of humbling ourselves before God. The Bible says, humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself. How do you do? One of the ways of humbling before God is through fasting. I fast twice. There are many other reasons why you should fast. And then I give my tithes. I give my property, my money, my, my things for the kingdom of God. Uh, to, to maintain this temple, to feed the Levite, to feed the priest, I give. And I think we ought to give also out of our earnings. God is delighted unto a person who is a cheerful giver. And the Bible is plenty in, in promising us that when we give unto God, God will not sit silent. He will reward us in many ways that we can't even understand. So the Pharisee has some good side that he obeys the commandments and he practices his spirituality. But tax collector, there is no good side of it. There is nothing good. From the Pharisee, you can at least learn these few things. But from a tax collector, there is nothing that you would like to follow as an example. These, these, these are hated people, not because they were hated because they were some good or decent people. The reason they received the title sinner, but they acted in a wicked way. For example, the best illustration would be for the Koreans here, that during the Japanese occupations, how some Koreans turned against their own people and sided with the Japanese and exploited their own. And now how do you look at these people? You don't feel good about them. And uh, if a decent patriotic citizen evaluates that condition, said there were some Koreans who were willing to die, there were others who were willing to kill and side with the enemy because it had some profit. It had an immediate benefit. Because of the immediate gratification of their sensual pleasures, they compromise honesty, dignity, loyalty. So these tax collectors were that kind of people. The example is from Zacchaeus. You see, that man was hated and that man was filthy rich and uh, he seems to be exploiting all those people who were uh, helpless in the face of the Roman occupation. So they had nothing that you would follow as an example. They were the picture of all evil. Yet, when the match comes to an end, and the boxing match comes to an end, the referee is standing. You are all, you know for sure who has received knockout blows. And you know 
Jesus is going to lift up the hand of the Pharisees, right? Winner. And to all our amazement, to these Pharisees' amazement, Jesus said, this Pharisee did not get his hand lifted, but this sinful tax collector got his hand lifted and said, Jesus said, this is the winner. This man went justified before God and Jesus has placed this evil tax collector as our example to follow. He said, this man went home justified before God. And if you and I are to be justified before God, then we have no choice but to follow this evil tax collector's example. Not the righteous Pharisee. The problem with the righteous Pharisee is that he allowed pride to rule his thinking. He allowed his pride to rule his thinking because he was a righteous person. He was holy, he was faithful, he was obedient, he practiced spirituality. So when he evaluated his own life by his own standard, he found himself to be a perfect human being. He found no fault in his life. So because he found no fault in his life, he can come to God and say, God, look at me. I thank you though anyway, but look at me. I am a righteous person. I am a faithful man, husband. I, I, I never commit adultery. I never falsi falsely testify against my neighbor. I never covet. I didn't kill. I didn't steal. Look at me. Therefore, I deserve the kind of life I have. I deserve this life. I am entitled to receive your blessing in my life. When this Pharisee evaluated his life in his own standard, he found himself a sinless man, a perfect man. And as a result, he did not see the need for God's mercy in his life. He did not see the need for God's grace in his life because he thought he's okay. His problem was not obeying the law. Law was okay. It was good that they should obey the law. His problem was not in fasting. He was supposed to fast. We all are supposed to fast. His problem was not in giving tithes and offerings. We all are commanded to do so. His problem was that he took all these good works as a substitute for him to be accepted by God. He thought, because I am doing these things, therefore I have the right to enter the presence of God. Therefore I have a right to come before Him and receive my life, my breath, my everything. Even if God does not do anything, I can do everything to save myself. That was his basic assumption. That because I am doing these things, I am a righteous person. Therefore, I'm okay. I don't need God's grace. I don't need God's mercy. I don't need God's help because I have already fulfilled the requirements. I have checked in all. It may come to you as a surprise but uh, in our experiences we have found that just as your immorality will drive you away from God, so will also your morality. If I am living an immoral life, it will drive me away from the fellowship with God. If I am living in a willful, immoral conduct, it will take me away from that intimacy peace, joy, life that is found in Christ. In the same way, if I am living a morally perfect life, if I think I am a just person, I am a perfect person, I am righteous, I am holy, I am moral, I have no defect in my life, this will also drive you away from God. 
just as your immorality will drive you away from God, so will also your morality. The moment you fall in the trap of being a moral person, the moment you try to be a good person in order to be accepted by God, in order to be justified by God, in order to, be, in order to receive the answer to your prayers, you fall in the trap of this Pharisee. You fall in the trap of the elder brother in chapter 15 who was slaving at home but he was far from the intimate relations with the father. So this Pharisee believed his morality and fell. He thought that he's perfect human being. Can you imagine coming before the creator of the universe? The perfect one. The perfect beauty, perfect love, majesty, whatever nobility there is in this universe. God is the symbol of perfection. And John couldn't find any word and said, God is love. The perfect love, perfect compassion, perfect beauty, perfect forgiveness, perfect holiness. And there this man comes and he presents himself as if he is the perfect one too. And Jesus is telling us, maybe you are perfect in some area. Maybe this Pharisee thought he was perfect in some area, but not in everything. We are conceived in sin. No, man, no amount of justification will get rid of your sin nature. There are theological thoughts that say, no, man is not born sinner. You know, there are very well-meaning Christians are following this line of thought nowadays. There are many books being written that you become sinner because you commit sinful act. You're not sinner because you're born sinner. How much we deny that? How much we try to rationalize, no, I am not sinner by nature. I become sinner because of my sinful act. If you fall into that trap, you will never be able to come closer to God. Because there is no other way apart from following the path of this tax collector. So there are times, even prayer life, when we pray, we do not come to God with confidence because there is this nagging condemnation. Oh, I'm not good enough. We fall into the trap of this Pharisees, Pharisaism that, oh, God may not hear me because I am not yet perfected. It's, it's a danger. I, I fell in that danger in my early part of my life. And sometimes, even now, the devil brings this kind of a spirit. Every time I fail to express my love to my wife or to my son or to my fellow human being, or somewhere I blew, and there is a, this the spirit comes, oh, you're not perfect. And I always remember Martin Luther's description. Every time there, there is a monkey on your shoulder, that's the time to shout and say, Praise God, I am not perfect and therefore Jesus is perfect for me. But it is a real danger that you will never be able to enjoy the life that God has brought in Christ if you fall into the trap of being better before you can hear from God, being better before you receive answer to your prayer, uh, prayer being better before you come to church, being better before you get uh, right with God. No, you can never get better enough, my friend. Jesus is presenting us the key factor that changes our life, and that is the understanding of the gospel. And it is that no matter how sinful you are, and no matter how righteous you are, makes no difference to the plan of God in Christ. Jesus Christ is the only solution as described through the life of this tax collector. The Phariseeism, you have to be better before you come. The tax collector, he comes to God and he is not able to look up to heaven. The body, bodily expression is that he is beating his chest or breast. The Pharisee, 
His method of evaluating his life is external. I did this, I did that, I did this. But the sinner's problem is here. The tax collector's problem is here, right in the heart. It's an internal struggle. And he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's all. The shortest prayer, one of the shortest prayers. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This tax collector also evaluated his life. Maybe, now there are debates whether was it the work of the Holy Spirit or was it the human freedom that brought him to that realization? That is beside the matter. That's not the topic here. The matter is this Pharisee and this tax collector, both of them got a chance to evaluate their own life. Maybe this tax collector was on the way. He heard about Matthew or he heard about Zacchaeus or many other friends. He has heard something. Of course, this is a parable Jesus is giving. This tax collector has come into the knowledge of God's great grace and he realized how sinful he is. He is convicted. He is convicted of his sinfulness and therefore he does not dare to look to God and he is beating his heart. It's painful when you realize how sinful you are, it hurts. You, when you realize how much closer you want to go to God, but then there is this sin nature always standing on the way, always pulling you back, always trying to destroy your relations with God and fellow human being, and it hurts. There is a pain within this man's heart. I wish I was a better person, Lord. I wish I did not have these things within my heart. Like Paul's. Romans chapter 7. I wish I was a different man, but God, I don't know. Now here I come. I fall at your mercy. I have fallen on my face before you. I throw myself under your care, O God. Do unto me as you wish. You want to send me to hell? I deserve hell, but have mercy on me. But the Pharisee does not recognize. He always just him, I'm better. I'm superior than the other person. I'm, I'm much righteous. I'm much holier. But this man says, no, I'm undone. Woe unto me. That's what Paul's like. Woe unto me, a wretched man. Who can deliver me from the bondage? But praise God. Amen. Praise God. Jesus deliberately puts this, uh, this parable here for us to understand that there is nothing that you can contribute to your salvation. Nothing whatsoever. It is by your sheer, simple belief in what Jesus has done. Said, Fall. Jesus have mercy on me. That's all. Jesus have mercy on me. I cannot make myself righteous. I fall on my face before you, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. This sinner believes in the character of God. The Pharisee does not believe in the character of God. He believes in his own personal character. But the sinner believes in the character of God and that is God is merciful. God is not some kind of a mean monster trying to destroy your life. He's not there to see when you make mistake and strike on your head. No, God is compassionate. God is merciful. That's when the John's language, the God is love. He's a compassionate God. And this sinner knows that if he throws himself in front of this compassionate God, he will receive mercy. In Hebrew chapter 11 verses, without faith it is impossible to please God. And what do you believe? Anyone who comes to him must believe that God is. And that he is the rewarder of those that seek him diligently. The compassionate heart of God. So, if you understand the gospel, there will be no place of pride in your life. If you understand the gospel, you will not feel superior to your fellow human beings. This Pharisee, this parable is given to those people who think they are self-righteous and then they 
despise others. They look down others. They compare themselves. They say, God, I'm good enough. And then they compare with the uh, fellow human. They, they despise other human beings who are not up to their standard. Maybe there is a race superiority here. Racism comes because people misunderstood the gospel. Uh, discrimination in the society comes because people don't understand what it is to believe in the gospel. Hate and uh, divisions and uh, gossip and all kind of backbiting comes because they do not understand the gospel. They fall into this lifestyle of a Pharisee and therefore once you're a Pharisee you have opened yourself to the all possible uh, broken relationship with human beings and with God. There is no place of pride in our life when we understand the gospel. And then there is no place of condemning others. You will always feel that others are better than yourself. Like Philippians, Paul says, consider others better than yourself. A gospel believer will never come to a position where we will enjoy being superior to his fellow human beings or her fellow human beings. The moment there is a, this comparison between two of you and you feel yourself giving better star and that is an indication that I need to be humble. I am allowing pride to ruin my life and my relations with my brother or sister. So, when we understand the gospel, like the sinner, we will fall on our face and say, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinful human being. Maybe I'm talented in this area, but I'm not talented in the other area. Maybe I'm perfect in one part, but I'm not perfect in every part. And maybe I fail in loving relations within my family. Maybe I fail in giving in, in faithful in giving. Maybe I failed in honesty or I failed in a working environment. But Lord, I fall on my face before you. I'm a sinful human being. I need your grace and your mercy. Once you understand the gospel, then you don't have to carry the burden. It's not that you keep on living in sin, but I dare say, I dare say, Whatever the sin you have in your life will matter nothing when you truly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will throw that away. So what? I made mistake. I'm a fallen human being. I'm a broken human being. I know by grace and by his mercy I will overcome it someday. If I cannot overcome, I don't care because my faith is in the perfect obedience of Christ. My faith is in the perfect righteousness of Christ. My faith is in the cross of Jesus Christ. If you understand the gospel, you will be free from pride, you will be free from hating others, and you will be free from burdens in your life. You will not allow the spirit of condemnation to pull you down. You will live in victory. Not sinlessness, but victory over sin. Amen? Amen. Sinlessness will come someday. Amen? We are still hey, oh, hoping for that. But even in this world, we will live in victory. Not because you're a righteous person, but because the one who is righteous is standing beside. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, let us understand the gospel. When you understand the gospel, instead of hating people, you will be compassionate. The Pharisees look down on others. But because you believe in the gospel, it will give you desire to respect others. It will give you desire to honor others. You will put others first in your life. But if you don't understand the gospel, like the Pharisee, you will put yourself first and you will start comparing with everyone around. And then Jesus said, if you exalt yourself, you will be humiliated. But if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. Any soul, any human being who understands the gospel of Jesus Christ and says, God, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. Therefore, I trust in you, Lord Jesus Christ. And then 
and receives the love of God within his heart or heart, he is free from pr pride. Every time pride comes, he repents or she repents and says, I'm sorry God, there is sin creeping in my heart. But praise the Lord Jesus Christ, he has taken away my sin, my shame. Every time you feel like hating someone else, you fall on your face and say, here I fall again, O oh God, forgive me. Thank you for loving unconditionally. You are the perfect lover and I am an imperfect one. And we, we get victory after victory. You may get the pinch. You've, when someone hurts you, you get angry, you get upset. But then once the pinch goes away, you fall on your face and say, Oh God, I'm sorry. Like the Pharisee, you don't justify. But like the tax collector, you beat your breast and say, Have mercy on me, O oh God. And then you leave that there. You don't carry it home. Jesus said, Leave the burdens with me and I'll give you rest. All who are weary and heavy and burdened, come to me and I will give you rest. And Jesus wants us to go higher, my friend. He wants us to live a life that is free. But that will come when you allow the burdens to roll away by understanding what Christ has done for you. And for that, this parable, you have to understand. No amount of good work will make you righteous before God. And no amount of sinfulness, if you repent, will prevent you from coming to God. No amount of sinfulness or immorality will ever be able to prevent you to come to Christ if you repent. Shall we bow our head? Hallelujah.